and we're gonna do it. Okay, welcome everyone to a discussion of sexual hegemony, statecraft, sodomy, and capital in the rise of the modern world system. My name is Greg Newton. I am the co-founder with my partner, Donnie Jokum of the Bureau of General Services Queer Division. We're an independent queer bookstore that's been around since 2012. And we have been hosted by the LGBT Community Center since 2014. Um, we like to say that we're a government agency for a government that does not yet exist. And right now we're a government in exile because we're not in our space. <laughs> but we hope very much to be back in uh, before the year is up. Um, we're just waiting on the center to give us the word. Um, so I'm super excited about tonight's event. I read the book a few months ago and it's very interesting. There's a lot to talk about. Uh, I wanted to briefly show you how you can purchase this book. Um, we're pseudo capitalists here at the Bureau because we do sell books, <laughs> even if we're not making money. Um, let me share screen, there we go. Boom, and so if you go to bgsqd.com slash store and you scroll down, you'll see a couple of collections of books and then you'll get to our featured products. And these are books for upcoming events. And we've been making our books for upcoming events 25% off as an added incentive for you to make that purchase. So please check that out. Check out other books that are on there. Oh, I also wanna draw your attention to the fact that we have a Reclaim, Reclaim Pride Coalition recommends. So we're working with Reclaim Pride Coalition, uh, the organization that has sponsored, organized the Queer Liberation March for the past two years. And we've been doing a couple of panel events with them on different topics. So on houselessness, on um, uh, prison abolition, on, uh, What's the other one I'm forgetting? Generations of activism. Our next one is going to be a week from tomorrow on radical black love. And then the final one will be sometime in June, we're still working on the date, is gonna be on sex work. So we hope you'll join us for those. And we're also talking with Reclaim Pride about um, continuing these panels throughout the year so that we don't just lead up to pride, that we actually are on in, engaging in these discussions all year round. So, with that said, I'm going to introduce our speakers, panelists, guests, and we're gonna get started. And I wanted to say, if you have any questions, you can put those in the chat function and I'll read those aloud to, the, uh, to our guests uh, towards the end. Um, so yeah, please engage in the chat function. So Hannah Black is a writer and artist. She lives in Brooklyn. You've got some really short, to the point intros here. Kay Gabriel is a poet and essayist. She lives in Queens. Max Fox is the editor of Sexual Hegemony and he lives in Philadelphia. So that's short, sweet, and let's get to it. Thank you so much, all of you for joining us. I'm gonna turn it over to you and let's get going. Put your hands together people so that they can see us clapping. We appreciate them taking the time to do this. Um, Max, who's going first? Yeah, I was. I was just gonna say, I, I'm not. We didn't. We didn't plan that part. Though I feel like, Kay, if you want to sort of frame this conversation with your really um, uh, helpful comment you made minutes I before, I do. Um, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Um, uh, so basically, you know, I mean, when Max invited Hannah and me to participate, I think one thing that I really, you know, would love to, for this discussion to be is to show that um, what Chris Chitty's book does is make other things, other thoughts possible. Um, uh, in addition to, you know, I, I, and, and he has like really interesting, compelling conclusions, but I think that... Um, where did I put the book? It's right here. It's in front of me. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think that um, sexual hegemony is not the end of something. It's the start of something. And so one thing that, you know, I at least want uh, uh, to do tonight um, is to just think about the, like the range of things that um, Chitty's book makes possible. 
Um, and so I, that's something I think that maybe the three of us are going to try to do um, as we will have some like maybe opening. I think what what is our idea? We're going to have some like opening comments. Um, about the book, maybe kind of like informally, and then and then um, and then like we should definitely have questions. So people should definitely write down their questions, um, and I think it's fine if they're hard questions. Um, did, Max, does that sound like it resonates with you as well? Yeah, I love that. I think, yeah, I think that uh, I think the three of us seem interested in kind of presenting, like. Our, our various like impressions of what is happening in the book um, and, and, and then using that as the kind of basis of a conversation. Um, which I'm excited about it because I love talking with both of you. I'm wrestling with my printer, but I'm excited about it too. Max, can I just interject to quickly ask you to maybe introduce how you got involved in the book, how you ended up editing the book? Sure, yeah. Um, uh, I'll, yeah, so uh, so there's a sort of professional and personal component, obviously. Um, I, I, I knew Chris um, uh, from, uh, from college, from undergrad. We were at University of, Santa, University of California in Santa Cruz together. Um, he was a graduate student and I was an undergrad. Um, and he was someone who like, um, made a big impression on me. He really kind of seemed to embody uh, two really um, uh, electrifying uh, strands of thought and ways of being in the world for me. Um, and and, and, he, and for, for him, that was kind of um, directed towards this big um, little intellectual project that he had been working on um, for a long time as part of this um, his PhD thesis, and so when he he died in 2015, um, I found it uh, kind of unbearable to think that that project would end um, then, and so I uh, I sort of took on the responsibility of 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 going through all of the drafts that I could get access to, um, and uh, editing them, and sort of sifting them into something that resembled a sort of coherent argument or narrative and then sort of shepherding that through the the academic press like you know process which was something that I didn't actually have a lot of um sort of uh, uh no experience with not a lot of like visibility into beforehand but I, I certainly um learned about it uh, along the way and so that's that's sort of that's my position. I have this kind of uh, yeah, kind of like not like I'm, I'm quite responsible for it, but it's not my sort of um, genius. That's that word that's sort of at stake right now. It's this. Um, should I maybe just go ahead and share my my little thing? Is that? Yeah, I think I think that would be helpful, especially because I imagine that it will provide a little bit more introductory context for people who haven't read the book. And you know, people here, I I I feel very strongly that you know, if you're here, you don't have to have read the book. Um, maybe Hannah and me should have read the book. <laughs> Max, you definitely should have read the book. Everyone else <laughs> can read it later. That's the question though. What book did I read? I read, so many, I read so many, so many of it, you know? Um, so yeah, so I can, I can kind of give a, a, a sort of um, segue into the conversation by saying like, okay, so he was, so the, the title gives a pretty decent um, sense of what's inside. Um, he is trying to do a pretty ambitious um, in terms of like historical span and also this sort of like theoretical uh, um, object, uh, like history of capitalism as a, as a sort of um, you know, historical phenomenon uh, through looking at this history of sodomy basically and how it relates to the sort of emergence and 
um, deployment of this particularly capitalist technology of the state. Um, and uh, that is, that's like the sort of very basic sort of outline of it. That's one of the things that sort of drew, drew me to it at the beginning when I was like, wow, I can't imagine what could be possible if you had um, an account of the history of capitalism that like said somehow that um, sexuality was like in this sort of central position. Um, homosexuality in particular is sort of his contention. Um, and uh, what I'm gonna talk about a little bit in my little discussion and um, for those um, super fans who, who might have been present at this talk that I gave a couple weeks ago at Penn, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna basically repeat it, um, is how I have, I, I've, I've come to understand what he's doing like slightly differently. I, I mean, I think, I think like in, in the sort of irrefutable sense that that is what his object is. He's, he's writing this sort of long history, um, kind of like parallel to Giovanni Arrighi's um, sort of analysis of, of capitalist development through these long cycles of accumulation. He's sort of um, reintegrating the Foucauldian story into a, a maybe more explicitly um, uh, like a materialist account, you might say, of um, uh, the capitalist development um, to kind of enrich the, the sort of um, uh, the history of sexuality story. Um, but um, yeah, I think if you, that, that's what I wanted to find basically is what I'm saying. That's, that's why I approached this text with such um, devotion basically it was because I had, I mean, besides the sort of personal stuff, I was like, this would really kind of cohere a lot of things for me politically and intellectually and emotionally um, in terms of my like attachment to projects. Um, but um, yeah, so I, I think at now at, at sort of the other end of the process of like putting it together after sort of staring at all these drafts for five years or so um, and trying to like make sure that I really, really understood what he was arguing. Um, I think I have a slightly different understanding of what exactly his sort of his project was. And this may be a bit of a, um, uh, what is the, this is a, I mean, it's a, it's a reparative reading, I guess, right? It's like, I'm, he, he didn't finish it. And this is me sort of saying, this is where he meant to go. Um, but basically I think through this sort of historical material, I can see him making an interesting argument about um, categories essentially. Um, and what I think maybe more specifically that he's doing is he's, he's saying it's, he's, he's making a proposition um, or he's undertaking these, this historical uh, investigation as a kind of um, cashing out this wager, which is to say that um, it's actually possible to grasp what is widely taken to be a trans historical concept, which is sexuality. Um, uh, you know, kind of famously, it's like human urge and has various sort of um, contingent appearances in all sorts of different societies. Um, he's saying, actually, it's historically specific. What, 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 is, what is sort of under investigation here is, is historically specific. Um, and in his terms, what that means is it's, it's, it's explicable with the specific categories of capitalist society. Uh, that is, it's sexuality itself is structured by the commodity, by capital, by alienated labor, by abstract time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and he, I'm, resting this proposition, this reading of him on a single line kind of, that is really evocative that I find very helpful, um, which is that he is trying to return the history of sexuality to the history of property. 
And there's a couple of different ways you can read that, uh, different registers or levels, one of which is like, uh, it's about the kind of disciplinary stuff that he's doing. So he's, you, could, you could read him as saying, actually, sexuality studies or queer theory is really and essentially and fundamentally a form of history. And as we all know, history is actually just the history of class struggle. Um, so that's what I'm doing. Um, th that's not exhaustive, I would say. Um, the other thing that you could read him as saying with that phrase is, I'm making sure everybody understands Foucault, who is denoted with the famous title of his book, History of Sexuality, is read as part of the Marxist tradition, which is then kind of denoted with the history of property, which is not usually how you, um, uh, what you call Marxism, but it's an interesting way of thinking about it. Um, and then, but, or, or then you can kind of get to this, this third sort of level of, of understanding or abstraction that I, I was just laying out, which is that sexuality itself um, is only graspable graspable as a historical object within the terms of the history of capitalist society. There are remnants perhaps that, it, that, that capitalist sexuality is sort of able to incorporate of pre-capitalist formations, but fundamentally what uh, remains is that which is um, uh, assimilable or congruent to the categories of capital society as structured by the commodity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that's a, that's a very high level abstraction, I'll um, admit. But so, and so then the, the, the rest of his book is kind of an, uh, uh, an examination of how that could even have come to be. Um, historically. And so that's where the sort of concept of sexual hegemony comes in, which is the name that he gives for this sort of technology that um, the bourgeoisie is able to deploy, develop, and then deploy uh, to exert um, political rule over classes which it dominates economically, but not always and not yet politically in the sort of course of its development. Um, and there is a, another line that is, I think, quite evocative or interesting that he may or may not, um, uh, substantiate as much as I would like, but I think it is really an interesting way forward, which is that, um, what sexual hegemony manages over the kind of entirety, the, the sort of the, the long durée or whatever, uh, kind of abstracted from its specific moments, which he analyzes chapter by chapter in the kind of um, particular um, cycles of accumulation that are sort of, he, he, he takes up from Giovanni Arrighi, who is this um, world systems theorist who, Whose, whose, whose story about capitalism is that there's four main sort of like mega cycles of accumulation that are that are governed and centered on these these main um, cities that um, kind of direct uh, capital accumulation as the world system expands around each of these centers and then kind of hit a, a, a wall of profitability or, or a capacity for profitable expansion and then kind of um, lose their, lose the crown and pass it on to the next one. And what he looks at in the book is what happens in this moment of transition. And he's, his kind of, his, his, his research is kind of organized by this insight that um, uh, a lot of the sort of legal armature for uh, anti-sodomy prosecution that kind of goes into the formation of excuse me, of a, of a sort of stable sexual deviant, sexually deviant, sodomite, homosexual subject that is the kind of like prehistory of the queer really only shows up in the historical record in these moments of hegemonic transition. So as, uh, let's say, the Northern Italian city-states are undergoing a crisis of profitability, 
they sort of shift to financialization and in the process basically subsidize the rise of Amsterdam, which in turn centuries later does the same thing to London, which in turn does the same thing to the United States. Um, and this was a theory that was sort of um, generated in the late 90s, I guess, and became quite sort of popular around the 2008 crash um, because it gave a kind of um, a literally world historical kind of frame for understanding what was happening, um, this new sort of instability. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why he uses that. But the other thing is that it kind of opens up an interesting way to find historic like echoes and commonalities between these the centuries long archive that he's looking at. Um, basically all the way back to ancient Greece, um, which otherwise wouldn't quite make a lot of sense if you're really trying to be specific, uh, restricting your research to what is specific um, about capitalist sexuality. Um, but it's this kind of like extremely long cycles that repeat um, that allows him to find something um, useful in, in, in these like, um, in these sort of predecessors. Um, sorry, that was a big digression. The line that I was going to cite um, that I find interesting is that um, in, the in the transition to these sort of, let's say mega cycles that Arrighi talks about, uh, that is the transition from feudalism to capitalism. Um, he says, this transition is related to sexuality and is in fact kind of the, the precondition for there even being an autonomous concept of sexuality because um, it, it wasn't this kind of like free floating thing that had to be managed or regulated um, before this transition because under feudalism, this was a social form in which property ownership was directly reproduced via biological reproduction, or sorry, biological procreation. It's then family units and proletarianization, which is the kind of like um, de-peasantization, the kind of like um, the enclosures and the expulsions from the land um, that happens in uh, various different accounts have different emphases, but it, it happens in Europe among other places. Um, proletarian is, is something that decouples biological reproduction from the reproduction of ownership. And so you have a, a sort of a new type of person that has, uh, that, that has a kind of biological reproductive capacity that has nothing to do with their relationship to ownership or employment. Um, and suddenly sexuality has to emerge as the mediator. Um, and so he finds this to be a kind of like key to looking at why um, the sort of new bourgeoisie, which is the class that's kind of the, you know, emergent agent of this whole transformation, um, is suddenly so, well, at, at the beginning, they're pretty indifferent, but over time, they become quite interested in proletarian sexuality. And so they need a way of kind of uh, getting their claws inside the proletarian family um, and making proletarians sort of act um, uh, uh, according to bourgeois norms um, when they are biologically procreating. Um, and so, so that's sort of his like object of analysis. He, he, he looks at it through the figure of the male homosexuality almost exclusively, the male homosexual, excuse me. Um, obviously uh, you, can't, you can't really understand that even if you really, really wanted to without any kind of other social characters showing up. So there are sort of um, uh, sex workers who are women, there are sort of uh, gender variant people, there are um, obviously there's like bourgeois people of all genders who show up, but it's, it's, it's mainly this story about proletarian men. And one of the big reasons why that's relevant for capital is because when you have a gender segregated um, workforce, um, you have to find some way of making sure that there aren't these sort of bonds of love um, or intimacy that are that are generated, um, and that's basically his kind of his his sort of way into this. And I think that um, 
you know, like, that's the story that I pieced together after sitting with his drafts for the number of years. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I committed a certain kind of um, like, uh, I don't know, imaginative sin maybe by imposing a, a kind of like unity on his thinking when it was really actually, you know, the kind of record of um, a bunch of different attempts at sort of working out what was true about this sort of intuition or insight. Um, and so it, there, there are a lot of ways in which the story that I told either isn't totally uh, substantiated in his in his text with with the examples that he's 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 he's, he's found, or um, I'm kind of like um, maybe hopefully reading these two lines as like more decisive than they were for him or something like that. But um, I I find it like Kay said I find it generative. I, f I found I mean I found it basically impossible to stop thinking about it. Um, so it was not the end of something. Um, to begin with, um, but uh, yeah, I think um, I think I think I think what he does or what he did is something that opened up a number of different ways of posing what appeared often to be kind of self-evident questions about categories of um, sex and gender that um, are quite like politically uh, alive now certainly um and 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 yet don't seem to have like obvious resolutions so um uh yeah i hope that's not taking up too much of our shared time but that's that's how i would sort of at this stage explain my thinking about it i'm wondering if he did christopher I mean, he was teaching, you know, mm -hmm. was, was he teaching, was he present, how much was he presenting these ideas and, and getting into public discussions? Was, was he speaking at conferences about the, uh, yeah, you know, um, presenting I mean, some these the, papers? Yeah, yeah. Some of, some of the, some of the, the sort of passages from, uh, that, that are in these chapters, like, uh, he delivered at, he delivered it at, at historical materialism, let's say, and and some of the other ones. So there's other there's other papers uh, that are sort of standalone that um, uh, his other friends who have magazines have published. So there's a couple of things that are really I would suggest you read on uh, Viewpoint Magazine in particular. There's a really 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 illuminating um, uh, reading of Foucault uh, and a translation of this lecture that Foucault gave that he did, um, that Chris translated. Um, and there's another one uh, on Blind Field Magazine um, called The Antinomies of Sexual Discourse. Yeah, I, uh, some of his students shared like slides and things that he, he, he gave as lectures. And I, I would really, I would love to, see his notes, but I haven't, I, I wasn't able, I mean, I mean, that's just not what I used. I, I wasn't able to get access to that stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, he was, he was writing and thinking and, and teaching. Um, so he was putting it out there already. <laughs> cool. Um, thank you so much, Max. That's so clarifying. Um, do you mind if I, uh, go next. Appreciate it. Okay, wonderful. Um, I, it's a, this panel is a, a real nation of bottoms, um, and everyone's letting everyone else go, um, except me. Um, kidding. Uh, so that's actually it's really clarifying to hear um, your reframing of your of your own reading. Um, uh, 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 and actually I think it like accords with some of the stuff, the stuff that I was going to say. Um, so I, I want to talk similarly and there's, there's some overlap, but it's not totally the same. Um, although I think, I think it's a consonant reading. Um, but I want to talk about what Chitty's work makes 
possible to see or what it allows us to see that we couldn't otherwise do. Um, I find the history, so the way that Max has edited this book um, is, is makes it very readable. And the first part, I, and I'm, it sounds like maybe you kind of drew this out of a structure that he had put in place, but it's sort of preserved into the version that we have in front of us. The first part is kind of the historical us uh, a, a chapter so there's a chapter on um florence and there's a chapter on amsterdam and there's stuff about gay pirates which is great um there's stuff about urinals um and there's stuff about about the us uh so kind of following this arigi pattern um but i'm not really a history girl um, and I want to follow a little bit more the second half of the book, which is two chapters at the end called uh, Homosexuality and the Desire for History, which I think like has, I don't think that we can really understand the force of the first section of the history in the first section unless we, uh, or, or until we receive the polemic in the second. Um, so, 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 so what is the argument that I, as I understand Chidi is putting forward and, and what makes, what, again, what does he make possible to see that we can see otherwise? Um, so Max has already noted that um, uh, uh, Chidi's book is doing Marx with Foucault, um, which is interesting because it's a little scandalous. I mean, it's not like, as, as he himself noted, I think one of his essays that I read, maybe probably the first thing that I read by him, even before Max, I think you and I had talked about his work, is one where he's like, it's, it was, I believe it was a historical materialism paper. And he talks that he was like, Foucault was a very careful reader of Marx. A lot of people don't understand this. Um, uh, like a lot of Marxists don't understand how careful a reader of Marx Foucault was. And so one of the things that he does is it turns an antagonism that we think we understand into a series of questions that we have not yet successfully answered. Namely, um, what actually do, what does the history of sexuality have to do with the history of property, which is to say the history of class struggle? Um, so one of the things that this does is it restores Foucault to, restores, forgive me, but it's true, um, to being a, to dialectical thought, right? To being able to do history dialectically with, and to being able to do the history of sexuality dialectically. Um, and that seems actually very important because Marxists have not exclusively, but typically been kind of ham-fisted about this thing. Um, like not everyone, um, Kevin Floyd, the late Kevin Floyd, um, is also has a pretty phenomenal book um, uh, uh, called The Reification of Desire that I highly recommend. Um, but, you know, he's kind of an outlier. Um, and a lot of Marxists, this is, this is historically true about the 20th century. A lot of communists in the 20th century were like historically pretty, pretty bad about like understanding the relationship between like, say, we could say like sexual liberation and social liberation. Okay, do those things necessarily go together? Well, no, um, but maybe they do. Um, and uh, we're also kind of historically ham-fisted about um, the, uh, uh, like, if we accept, which I think is one of the claims in Chitty's book, that the, uh, 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 that homosexuality is a category of bourgeois society. It is unthinkable, not, not same-sex desire, not same-sex sex, but like homosexuality as an identity category is a feature of bourgeois society. It develops out of proletarianization. This is one of the things that he establishes. He's not the only person to do this. John D'Amelio also does it, but he, he, he actually follows the history through it like much kind of further and deeper than John D'Amelio. And he's able to like kind of go back to the proletarianization of peasant populations together with maritime workers in Europe and to say that these forms of contact, that's a Chip Delaney word there, um, between classes made it possible for uh, certain dis practices and, and, and acts and behaviors and cultural signifiers to solidify into something that is perceptible as an identity. Right. So, so this is like, 
Uh, so, so this is important, right? Because he's also not saying, you know, he makes it possible to to really, I mean, he, again, not the only person to, to, to do this, but he does it really exhaustively and on a larger scale than someone like John D'Amelio uh, in his essay, Capitalism and Gay Identity. Um, uh, uh, Chitty is working with centuries longer material. Um, and so that's like already really appreciable, right? Um, and, and it makes, makes it possible to understand that homosexuality is a category of bourgeois society, which is not to say that homosexuality is bourgeois, right? Like, uh, and there have, like, you know, there have been kind of bad moments, you know, we can think of uh, the Vince Ramos brigades in the US, which uh, uh, sort of infamously were like, well, you can't go to Cuba with us if you're gay, because because <laughs> that, that, you know, being gay is, is bourgeois decadence, right? Um, so people have kind of made this mistake in the past, um, uh, so, so, we, so this is a long way of saying that Chitty, I think, is asking a Foucaultian question, how do practices and behaviors and acts and cultural signifiers congeal into an identity, but he's not approaching it with a Foucaultian response or with a Foucault, he like, he basically thinks that Foucault gets this wrong. Um, uh, he uh, kind of lumps Foucault in with what he calls nominalism, which is to say, and, and he has a, a great line about this, perhaps due to his professed Kantian leanings. Foucault cultivated an indifference towards de-differentiating the ontological from the epistemic, reducing being to the historical limits and form of knowledge. In other words, you kind of get that weird like David Halper and oh, homosexuality has only existed since it became possible to say that there were, since the word homosexuality, which is not true. Um, and one of the things that it like avoids or, or, or mistakes or, or, or um, fails to reckon with is the, is like emergence um, and I think that's actually one thing that his book like focuses a lot on is like an emergent category, um, uh, uh, an emergent structure that in Raymond Williams's terms hovers at the very edge of semantic availability, which is to say it is there, um, but it is not necessarily entering into language at every point at which it is also determining of structures. Okay, so this is interesting, right? What are some of the reasons why this is interesting? We're not just nerds who are, because, you know, basically like uh, uh, Chitty talks about like, we, so we are, <laughs> but we're not just nerds who are asking this question academically. I mean, one of the things that Chitty is really strong on is he's like, oh, everyone who's asking this question, whether they are looking for an all time historical basis for their identity, I'm an essentialist, I am going to look to ancient Greece, I'm picking out this thing, this is my gay identity, boom, right? Or they're nominalists, they're like David Halpern and they're saying homosexuality was invented in 1867, right? Everyone is looking, everyone is gay for history. Everyone is looking at history and attempting to write homosexuality as a narrative about history. Okay, so that's interesting. Why is that interesting? It tells us something about how, you know, we come to know ourselves through telling narratives in this particular way. That's not a bad thing. Um, Chitty is not a post-structuralist. He doesn't think that like narratives are, are, are bad. They are ways of making sense of complicated situations. For instance, the very complicated situation that Chitty himself was writing into, um, I assume sort of up to the moment when he died and, and then when he died, um, which is what he calls an interregnum. Um, that is a Gramscian term. Basically it refers to a historical period of transition between one dominant structure and another, but also it's a kind of epistemic term. It's like, there's a pattern happening. It's really hard to recognize this pattern. So what's the interregnum that he's writing into? Well, you know, we can let's, and, and I think this, this comes back to the kind of the second, the first question is like, how did all of these things become homosexuality, right? How did that become thinkable? How did that become such a determining category of uh, 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 of the formation of political blocks, of statecraft, of state power, of class power on both sides. Um, like, how, how did this thing happen? And then there's the second question, which is like, why does it matter? So we have some answers about why it happened. But then there's this question about like, why does it matter? Well, and so to, to maybe to start to answer this question, we can look at this interregnum, right? Which is this period where it seems like, you know, it's, it, we're, we're kind of, and, and again, we're, this is a sort of, this was a moment of like political awakening for me when I, when I was in my like late teens and early twenties at the, the, the start of the past decade. Um, uh, when, you know, it's like, 
we're at this moment when it feels like we are rounding a historical corner on sexual liberation, but at the same time, um, everything, all these other structures of people's lives are uh, falling into progressively deeper into crisis, right? And so you have this, what he calls, what Kitty calls the de-differentiation of class, vertical class structures, but not because of like equality and justice for all, but rather because of like deepening income inequality, for instance, right? Um, because of all of the effects of us of, 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 of the surround life that we refer to as like conveniently as neoliberalism, rollback of the welfare state, attacks on labor, um, uh, uh, in this country, mass incarceration, things like this, right? All of these things are happening at the same time and it also feels like, oh, not only has a kind of gay rights struggle, so the subjective orientation of like gay people together that kind of seems to fit us all on the progressive side of history, is big civil rights, a version of a civil rights movement that's say carried on from Stonewall right up to what, like Lawrence v. Texas and, um, and, and you know, gay marriage and on and on. And it seems like we round this corner and we win the things that we want to win and it sucks, right? Like this narrative, we could call this narrative win or loses, right? It's a narrative that like we have won narrow legal recognitions for ourselves and it fucking sucks, right? So this is, this is I, I, I'm about to problematize this because I don't actually think this narrative is true. Um, but it's palpable and it rings a bell and it feels very deeply like something that is real about the world. It's, and what, it, what this narrative is telling us is it's like, oh, we achieved sexual liberation and all of these things that we wanted were co-opted. And so therefore we were managed to kind of successfully achieve like formal rights and recognitions for gay people. Um, uh, uh, and that uh, didn't, that happened at the same time as a kind of deepening of capitalist crisis experience on the level of economy and ecology, jeopardizing the ability of everybody in the world to live. Okay, so that is a very palpable way of feeling. In some sense, it's obviously true. It's also the case that I don't think that we can say, oh, this failure, it's, I don't think this failure is a failure of the gay and lesbian left. Um, it's just the fact that these things happened at the same time as other deep structural transformations in, in the economy of the overdeveloped global core. Um, which, you know, so at the same time as we were able to win on certain things, you know, I mean, like uh, Sarah Shulman says this in her, the introduction to her new like ACT UP history, right? Um, she, she says like, like uh, AIDS activists could change the paradigm around HIV AIDS, but they couldn't defeat international capitalism. And if that's what you are approaching this history with, if this is what you're asking for from these people, you're asking the wrong questions. Um, which is not to say that that's not the right goal. It's just asking the wrong questions about this period of history, right? Okay, so, so why does this matter? If um, Chitty is correct, that in a situation of deepening crisis, homosexuality will become less important as a politicized site of affiliation and subjective alignment um, including alignment, let's say, with like left movements. And so if there is this, this, and this, this is the thing that he calls again, like the interregnum, right? Um, if that is one of the features of the historical transition and the deep crisis and, and, and uh, of the reproduction of human life that we are experiencing currently, that does not mean that this thing, this kind of winner loses narrative is necessarily our fate. And this is one of the things I think that I, I, I'm gonna kind of clarify what I mean by that in a second, but like, this is one of the things that I think that sexual hegemony allows us to see very clearly because he is really sharp on the fact that all of these events are contingent. They became contingent necessities. We didn't have to end up with this kind of like, uh, with, with gay identity being like such a structuring force in certain forms of statecraft and the formation of certain political blocks and, and, and in political economy in certain ways, but it happened. And because it happened, and we, we can't just get rid of it, right? If that's what, so that's a contingent necessity. 
also, it was never, it wasn't guaranteed that a certain like kind of bourgeois ruling class was going to just get good with this particular thing. And in fact, he demonstrates all the points when, you know, a period of relative permissiveness uh, is followed by a, per a period of severe crackdown, right? And so it's not like we can just say, oh, this thing is fine, everything's fine, because we can imagine other arrangements of power that would exploit certain panics and fears that people have about the world and use certain convenient scapegoats to activate them to create political blocks in other ways. Okay, why does this matter? Well, as we sit with the fact that there are a number of emergent, let's say, sexual and gender formations that deeply press on a certain nerve about how people want to live their lives and that are that align people in struggle in certain ways with certain people in ways that are certainly related to like class position and access to resources, but not determined by them. Um, and by this, I mean, you know, like you could just say broadly like trans people, but I don't want to be like that, like reductive about it. Um, it means that we, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking this because, you know, like Jules Gleason and Ella Rourke just released their book called Transgender Marxism, which is very good. It's from Plato Press and people should read it. Um, and one of the things that they wrestle with in the introduction is they're like, why are trans people communists? We don't know. Um, it does that have to do with the fact that like trans people are like, you know, often like pretty poor, pretty unemployed, have certain kinds of housing jeopardy, are more likely to be involved in sex work and drug use? Well, like maybe, um, but it's not per purely determined by that, right? Um, and then, you know, as we ask this question, we try to sort of figure out how these various emergent plot points, uh, uh, like, like uh, points on a map, right, of uh, gender and sexuality relate to class struggle at other points. Um, and what pattern do we find ourselves in? I think it's very important for us to, to not take for granted either that the sort of bourgeois liberalism that ended up greeting the gay rights movement eventually after significant struggle and organization with open arms, we can't take that thing for granted. And what we also cannot take for granted is that the things that we are fighting for on our side are just going to be kind of co-opted into a deepening of bourgeois class relations. Um, the 2020s are not the 1990s and they are not the 1970s. Um, people are deeply in debt. They are deeply unemployed and underemployed. Um, can uh, capital restructure itself in certain ways that it did in the 1990s and the 2000s and the 2010s that successfully turned, um, say like pride parades into TD Bank uh, floats, you know, like, can that happen again? M maybe, um, who knows, right? Uh, uh, let, let's say, let's hope not, right? But this question, I think, and this is where I'm going to end, uh, 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 this question of an open alignment, um, like, I think that Chitty prompts us to ask and gives us resources to ask, you know, like, what like basically, if we accept the, the contingency of certain forms of cert, a subjective development in periods of crisis through how capitalism forces some people apart and other people together, right? If we accept that that is a feature of the world we're living with, then we are able to ask with curiosity rather than answering as if we already know the question of how um, as I think he puts it, how certain bodies are going to line up in space um, with political demands. I think that's everything I have to say for now. So I'll just kick it back to, I will kick it over to Hannah. Thank you. Wow, so cool. For some reason I was convinced we would all have the same thoughts, but I now see they're so different. Um, I um, uh, was thinking, as I read, I was thinking of um, this beautiful story that Max told me a long time ago about Chris Chitty, and it was a story of when he was a kid and he was sent to be um, kind of, uh, what do you call it, like straight re-educated at a, a Christian fundamentalist uh, camp of some kind, and they would read from the Bible to try and uh, prove the, um, that it was bad to be gay or whatever, and he, he then went and learned Chris Chitty as a kid went and learned ancient Greek because he was like, I don't believe that it says that in the Bible. And then he was like disappointed because it did say that in the Bible. But I think with this, with this book and like with Max's help in like posthumously like assembling it, I feel like he has, I, I read it as actually achieving 
the goal of um, making a case that they're kind of that there's yeah so somehow he kind of completed this this gesture that I, I remembered from the story of him as an adolescent and I find that very beautiful about the book I thought it successfully um I felt that what the book does is it takes something there's always a pitfall with this kind of narrativization of sexuality where you kind of accidentally naturalize heterosexuality kind of so it's as if you're giving an account of why there are like deviations from an imaginary norm. I think this book really scrupulously, I, fe I felt kind of avoided that and actually does successfully present um, what we would refer to as like homosexuality or being gay or like whatever, or like men having sex with men as like just a kind of a completely standard variation of, of human activity that was that is somewhat trans historical or is historically continuous or is kind of not something that would be unusual to find in any period of human history because obviously I mean, and obviously the reason for that is all that evolution would have to give us to kind of ensure uh, reproduction is, is, is the desire to, to have sex. I mean, there's no, you'd have to like, you kind of basically have to believe in God to think that there's some extraneous kind of um, categories put on top of that or whatever. Anyway, so I feel like that's a really convincing argument. And what it then does is it kind of does something similar to maybe how you could think of theses of racialization. So, because while, you know, race isn't essential, there is, there is um, phenotypical, phenotypical difference of various different kinds or whatever that then gets politicized so that so the punch so the kind of punctuation marks that Chris is finding throughout history like when he looks at um uh Florence or at Amsterdam or whatever is there are moments where it's not it's, it's moments where homosexuality or men, uh, men having sex with men is like is, is kind of politicized or whatever and uh, and one and I found the Florence example extremely so I so then it was like okay well given this is kind of that then means this is no longer in some in some ways this isn't a theory of sexuality because I think he somehow dispenses with some that that in a sense dispenses with the necessity of a theory of sexuality sexuality just kind of exists right I mean which is not completely but in a sense it changes the emphasis of that so then I was like well what is this a theory of then and I felt it was a theory of uh to some extent a theory of lumpenization. And, uh, and I was really, because uh, because it's like, and I was thinking of, and I actually was really helped by watching the book launch where um, Max was in conversation with Chris Nealon and Toby Hazlitt and they ended up talking somewhat, they, the, the topic of kind of surpluses, surpluses in the sense of both um, value, and, you know, in the sense of the production of value, it necessitates the creation of various surpluses and so there's this kind of the surplus, surplus value. And then there's also a surplus, uh, kind of surplus like reserve army of like surplus populations of different kinds that are kind of thrown off by capital and in the book Chris contrasts this to like pre-capitalist societies such as Sparta where he says that instead in, in these societies the, the surplus because they're, they're not capitalist so the surplus isn't kind of externalized in the various ways that it is in capital where people are kind of pushed out into a kind of abject zone or value is kind of extracted from labor or whatever but instead in the Spartan society surpluses are literally consumed as like communal meals that are then that Chris also somehow sees that I mean and, and this is a kind of un, maybe underworked out part of the book that I was like briefly discussing with Max just before this talk or whatever but but he kind of sees that he sees that so that's the social zone these like communal meals in Sparta are somehow also the site of the kind of development of a like self-conscious self-aware um culture of sex between men or whatever or he at least kind of seems to try and posit that whatever which is kind of I think which I think sort of points to how he is sort of similar to, he's he's Chris himself seems really ambivalent about the potential revolutionary or not kind of content of um of um of, of sex between men but um but anyway, so then, so then, you, what, so then, I think what's what's then made available is the idea that, like, um, in the sense that what, uh, so, so, okay, so then, the, one of the really fascinating examples in the book is like the situation in Florence in, is it the the fifteenth century, um, and uh, and there's this kind of uh, office of, office of the night, and basically what it does, it's so it kind of. Um, it actually ended up reminding me, and this is a little bit stretching it, but reminding me of the discussion in Jackie Wang's book, Carceral Capitalism of the, and Toby Hazlitt also mentions it in the essay that Max mentioned on the rights, but the kind of extreme extraction practices that were happening in Ferguson in the lead up to the, the uprisings around Michael Brown's murder by police or whatever, there was extremely intensive extraction happening in Ferguson in this, um, and, uh, and this is fresh in my mind because I've just read Toby's essay, but there was examples like a, a single a single traffic stop, uh, the cop would manage to extract like 20 different kind of um, fines from the same person or whatever. And they almost had a competition if you could do that. And what's happening in Florence. So just to read from, the, I wonder if I can find the, the right part. Um, uh, yeah, so the population of Florence had forced the state to adopt what seems like a surprisingly modern rationality, the city monetized sodomy, 
Um, so they were, so basically like people could report, there were like anonymous boxes where you could do like tip offs of like these guys are fucking and then they would get fined. And that could also be something that we can mediate various like disputes between people of different kinds, disputes between men having sex with each other or kind of like a different kinds of social disputes. I mean, every time you have like an anonymous comments box, you can just imagine the kind of shit people are getting up to. So anyway, so they've, they've um, monetized sodomy Considering the magnitude of such revenues, Florentine merchants' previous persecution of sodomy represented more of a tax or rent collected from its population than a rabid moral campaign of repression and punishment, as was now advocated from the pulpit. Ep epitomizing that infamous Florentine irony, the tax on sodomites went to provide for the upkeep of a large convent of reformed prostitutes. So the sort of like, so the sort of potentially like a, a problematic or, or kind of, so, so the sort of like, um, kind of social problematizing of sex between men that has various functions. And I think Chris suggests various ways, various sort of origins for that. But um, it's also interesting that the money then flows back into kind of um, sort of more, more properly socially reproductive uh, uh, instruments, such as like kind of rehabilitating women, like, I don't know, perhaps so they can become uh, like functional, like bearers of children. I don't, I don't know what that, the intention was overall there or ever. I mean, Chris also thinks that the, the sort of um, office of the night and the ways that it would kind of, you know, with the anonymous questions box and so on would also kind of stir up drama was also a way to kind of break potential kind of cross-class different, or just, just kind of potential forms of solidarity because um, uh, because I think one of the, so because if you think about lumpenness, it's also somehow, so anyway, so then I was off on a whole thing about lumpenness because I think this is one of the big questions of our era is how to unify that which, ex, you know, the kind of the already politically inscribed into, um, uh, you know, the, how to unify the kind of the, the correctly political with the, um, with, with this kind of like, um, more kind of in, in co kind of um, uh, you know like harder to mobilize kind of field of people which is and I, and I think um, that's something that you know obviously is famously like an issue in Marx himself and like um, and where you know often in Marx will be uh, there's uh, we um, yeah there's often kind of like these moments of heterogeneity that are kind of signal lumpenness kind of so in Marx when you get like these big lists of like you know it's like organ grinders uh, prostitutes um, you know like whatever faggot you type people I actually think it's also not the case that um sorry just also wanted to say something just back to my prior point about the, the way Chris situates gayness or um, homosexuality or men having sex with men in history I think he does kind of also in the Florence example that are kind of portraits of people who stand pretty identifiably um, like gay people. I mean, I think I think it's also kind of, I, I actually think I've sort of recently become fond of the idea that's just always been gay people because that's just something people tend to notice kind of in the same people sort of notice that as a like, as a variation and those and those things tend to then be socially in difference, can then be socially inscribed or whatever. So, so I thought that was super interesting about the use of fines and how that relates to lumpenness, because I think that's, and this is obviously getting more into the kind of Marxist like structural kind of stuff, but it's like, there's this like outside of the wage, there's like proper people behaving properly within the wage. And I think, um, and then there's this externality to the wage, which is where people are a little hectic and they're doing weird things and it's hard to get them to do stuff and so on. And often this becomes really literalized, you know, for example, when you get like Occupy, I know, I know Chris Chitty himself was very involved with like, I think Occupy Oakland, right? So obviously these are always sites where you it's like direct encounter between like the political, you know, the nice young people who, who you know, including sometimes myself, whatever, who are like, I'm a student and I love Marx or whatever. And then suddenly it's like, I'm a homeless person who, a houseless person who has like mental health issues and we're going to try and now like have this space together or whatever. And I think that these, these kind of sites, so I think actually, I to me, it, I, I, I mean, I can, I should probably stop talking now so we can all um, talk uh, towards each other. I had a bit more to say on this, but it, it's I've kind of a little bit like drifted away. But I think these, it, to me, this seemed like the book seemed like a really, interesting opportunity to kind of rethink this the various ways that the kind of um attempts you know that because because in a way there's something similar i was thinking how there's a thing that's almost like a mirror of primitive accumulation like primitive accumulation or original accumulation in marx and uh is this idea that there's a the capital and it's been updated by various people like rosa luxemburg to think of so they now think of it as a more continuous process or whatever so so there's a kind of like there's there's constant there's a constant like raw bleeding edge of how capital like stuffs more and more stuff into itself like actually capital can't exist as a total system it always needs some kind of outside so if there's not one it has to make there be an outside or whatever and which is kind of what happens when you sort of radic when you kind of other people in the sense you say that well now we've decided that having sex with men is like is something that can then like other you in, in relation to the social uh, as a whole or whatever so um so uh, kind of within, within so I guess like Oh, sorry, maybe I'm just going to confuse myself trying to do a massive structural argument and we can just come back. But I, I guess it just made me think of the, the outside of the wage and how there's a kind of, so there's this process of um, 
sorry, there's a process of original accumulation that Marx describes, which is how capital expands itself, right? But it's like equally as thinking about how in terms of like po politics, like how we do like capital P politics, we're always like at some kind of bleeding edge of inscription, right? It's like, actually sex workers can be political subjects. Like actually, you know, gay people can be political subjects. So, um, and that's always a really like um, con contentious, difficult moment or whatever, because, and it, and it makes me think of these various moments where what happens is a kind of splitting. So it's like, you know, like Joy James's critique of Angela Davis, how, how Davis splits herself off from the more the more sort of like a prolis the, the more lumpen end of the movement um it happens in terms of the defund stuff where we where where a lot of the the defund stuff has had to for various political reasons that makes sense and is strategically coherent but it's had to articulate itself as sort of against the mess against crime in some way it's had to kind of like sever its link with the kind of lumpen population and kind of declare itself also against crime but by different methods or whatever so i think there's you know these these are, i'm not coming down on i mean i'm you know whatever it's not for me to say which side it, to, to kind of pick a side or whatever but I just I think it's I found this book kind of helpful and kind of um the, to kind of insist on a kind of sim sympathy with the lumpen or a kind of like or a kind of um that you have to, to read history through the lumpen and to kind of read it outside of the wage and outside of labor as the only category of social struggle or whatever and actually to just explode that to the point you no longer really have to make claims for why these different aspects of identity might become politically activated because there is no primacy of labor if you see what I mean sorry I probably went a bit like whatever at the end but that was that was all the many thoughts that I had <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted Kay to respond because actually Kay said something amazing the other day about the state is the organization of surpluses like you said like that is and I was thinking about how that's in both redistributive and repressive functions but actually the redistributive and the repressive are always together right they're always together there's not the state has over here a redistributive function and over here a repressive function but they they always in a sense you know prisons are also kind of in weird ways they're kind of like welfare and like um social work is carceral and these things constantly cross over each other but yeah Great. yeah no that's that's super helpful i mean i another time we should talk about the defund stuff because i don't agree with your reading there um i don't think that defund is casting aside crime or the lump and I think that it actually is like an attempt to address what are the situations that have pushed people into like deep dispossession where the things that they do to try to um, uh, take hold of their lives um, become castigated as crime and, 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 and mark them off as people who can be put, it, who can be ideologically and legally put into boxes. Right. Um, and so I, I think that it actually is a kind of attempt to address this process. But um, but I, I'm really persuaded by this reading that, you know, like takes us out of a certain romanticism about like a certain romanticism about like, we could even just say like trade. Um, uh, you know, like our certain romanticism about like who the category is, like one of the things that Chris Chitty talks about really beautifully and really well in his book is the, um, like the, the, the cross class contact of, 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 of same sex desire and sexual practices, um, uh, have I frozen, by the way? Are people, I can't tell. Okay, great. Sorry. Uh, my internet frequently hiccups and I can't tell if people are listening to me attentively or they're just like, I'm just staring at blank images. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so that's, <laughs> thank you, Hannah. I love you too. Um, it loves you back. Um, but okay, so, so, you know, like one of the things that he talks about is like this kind of like cross-class contact, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of between bourgeois and working class people, men, basically. He's really not that interested in women. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm not, I don't think that, I'm not saying that he's like, you know, writing women out of his history, but it's, he is focused on this one thing and that's okay. Um, uh, I, I, you know, like, and we can move back from a certain romanticism about like, I, I don't know, you know, like, I mean, a kind of like Hart Crane style romanticism about like factory work, like people who are actually employed, the category of people who are contingently employed into thinking about people who have to sell labor power and how 
this, the fact of having to sell labor power, whether or not you are able to sell labor power, um, and being forced into various kinds of urban poverty, um, uh, provides the spaces that produce, um, uh, 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 um, uh, spaces that produce, um, or that like facilitate like gay sex basically, or same sex sex, but you know, like just for, for the sake of ease, let's just say gay sex. Right. And I mean, I think here about like city of night, um, John Ritchie's novel city of night, um, which, you know, is so interesting in large part because it's like a pre Stonewall novel about gay sex. So it has like, I think one of the things that we don't talk about enough when we talk about City of Night is that it has this like totally different paradigm of consciousness um, from someone who then also wrote a bunch of novels after Stonewall, right? And after a kind of gay liberation moment, but it, he's writing at this period where like you get like, you know, he really, he's talking like the kind of the whole tragedy of the first half of City of Night is like, he's in love with his bro, who's also like a hooker and they can't, they're just bros and bro love, but they're like in love and they can't like do anything about it because like sex is something that you do with like gay sex is something that you do for the guy who hires you. So I think that that's like, that's interesting. And it, it's like an interesting moment in the, this kind of like, um, in this, in a period that is actually like quite, oh my gosh, hi Chris, nice to see you. <laughs> um, uh, 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 so, but you know, like this, this period that's um, uh, 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 like quite proximate to our own, but actually substantially different. Um, and that, that I think that that speaks to the kind of lumpenization that Hannah's talking about. Um, Max, do you have things to add here? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there was so much there. I just want to, I don't know if this is gonna throw the conversation off or if it's gonna be productive, but I think that, yeah, I think the, I think you're, one of the really uh, generative or admirable or um, appealing things about this is his like, yeah, he's like um, really not interested in or uh, opposed to like um, indulging these kind of romantic notions, even though he has these like beautiful uh, histories of like, you know, gay or queer proletarian revolt as kind of maybe not like the secret motor of history, but like always there at every sort of sort of uh, cycle of accumulations end and therefore is a part of the inflection or whatever. But he's never, he's not saying like in the same, it, it, yeah, I think Hannah, your, your point is totally right that like he's not, he's, he's so not making an argument that like gays are proles and therefore they like are the subject um, to be liberated because they have this kind of like moral um, appeal that we all share in or whatever. Um, uh, <clears throat> and one of the interesting ways that that is present is that, um, you know, uh, the, uh, that's become more uh, apparent to me in the past couple of months even is that um, sodomy is not uh, sex between men per se, it's sex between men and boys, right? And that's something that like is very uh, like correctly and widely abhorrent um, in the present, but like is 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 basically the the subject of his investigation. Um, and like and 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 so what he's looking at is this kind of like like you're saying like a pretty foreign uh, uh, order of of um, uh, intelligibility. That's uh, two hours. There's, a, there's a really, there's that very, there's that really heart-rending example where there's a 18-year-old and a 20-year-old who are caught having sex and then like brutally executed that somewhere, I think. In oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's not, and he actually has an account of why, I think he's saying that it's the, the sodomy that becomes visible to the state often is across a kind of differential, you know, because mm -hmm. it can't be managed within, within its own sphere or whatever. So, sorry, just as a little note. Sorry. No, totally. Though what's interesting is that, I mean, in the Florence stuff, it was precisely the differential that, that made it stable, right? Because men sort of uh, like rediscovered their, their, their status by fucking boys, then that was fine. But if a man were to have sex with a, a peer, 
then well, yeah because i think the passive active stuff sort of actually is really interesting in relation to machiavelli or what he wants to do with machiavelli because he almost wants to kind of like read I, I mean i don't know i actually don't know enough about it almost about the actual history of machiavelli but he does want to read him as way gayer than he's read so he kind of like has this almost like i can't remember there's a story of like a, a a very monumental political assassination that kind of starts with this like gay rape or whatever so he kind yeah. of, and i thought about you know obviously like this is um uh, you know the kind of feminist scholarship idea of like how it's interesting that Machiavelli because uh, thinks of Fortuna as a woman and the sort of activity of the political is to sort of like be be kind of have this like ag ag agentic or kind of like um, active relation to the otherwise passivity of fortune which is just kind of waiting to be mm -hmm. taken or whatever so I kind of think you could probably I, I felt like you could push the Machiavelli stuff further in that direction and, and that which obviously falls into kind of an idea of statecraft sorry I'm going to yeah, stop yeah. <laughs> you know, the Machi I mean, the Machiavelli stuff is so fascinating I really wish he had been gayer because he really it would have made that chapter so much tighter I think but like the funny that there is there, there is some part that is substantiated which is that uh Machiavelli's um patron Soderini was himself denounced in this uh in this anonymous accusation box for sodomy and be sort of driven from power by a group of um patrician sodomites or patrician men who were like overturn our friends convictions for sodomy and uh and and um and you're out basically and that's and that's sort of why machiavelli is writing these reflections from exile so you could if you really wanted to be a sort of i don't know um uh overexcited uh interpreter you could say that that is really the, the sort of the origin of, of of modern sort of hero political theory but um uh yeah, it's this question of anyway. It's it's so so he is in, he's interested in like okay, you were saying like this question of like how 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 do you, how do you like why are we gay for history? Like how do you how do you find it uh, even like appealing, let alone thinkable, to sort of take on these like um, prior forms to legitimate who you are and what you like in the present, like where does that come from? Um, she's very interested in kind of like unpeeling that and being like, you think that there's this kind of like lineal um, uh, uh, assurance that um, gives you the, re the, the right or whatever, the sort of, the, the ma makes your desire necessary rather than contingent or something that you've chosen um, or we have sort of collectively um, generated uh, behind our backs, let's say. Um, but in fact, it, it is this kind of imaginative process that has everything to do with um, uh, sort of misreading these quite heterogeneous periods where actually, like, and it's so, I mean, yeah, yeah. anyway, it's. Um, well, so, so yes, and he also, and this is why, you know, Chris's work is not just kind of doing a Foucauldian thing. It's why it's like a kind of like doing Marx with Foucault, right? Mm -hmm. Because he actually is able to go like, okay, well, you know, like all of these people at these different points, like love to go back to like, look at Plato's symposium and go like, look, men having sex with. Um, I actually want to nudge against that kind of like men and boys thing because the, the kind of form of like Greek, ancient Greek, like same sex desire is like quite specifically like, it, it's it's like men who are in the prime of life and like uh, 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 people who we I guess we would now call teenagers, right? Like yeah, you're, you're like you're actually it, a classic. It is kind classic. of important to be like you know to look at different like constructions of of things like maturity um, that licensed like different forms of contact between people. So it's, it is kind of just to not like. Just, just to be sort of like, but, but, but in any case, you know, like, like people at different points, like looking at this example and going like, okay, Plato talked about this in, in the symposium, this justifies the thing that I'm doing. Okay, fine. So that's, that's an imaginative relationship. But the other thing that I think like he's able to establish is like, okay, but there is this much longer stand, this, this, this other historical process, which is this process of proletarianization, um, uh, men being employed in maritime trades, um, 
uh, cer certain circuits of capital that like bring materials to various centers of production, um, that bring people into places that that group cities together in certain ways, such that you know, like maybe you have an alley where it's possible for two people to do stuff that they can't do in a boarding house where they share rooms with like twelve other people, whatever, whatever, right? Like, and and so this. Um, you know, like, so this is the actual kind of like lingerie historical process, which links all of these things together, even though, you know, like, and, and, and actually puts them into one, in, in a sense, makes them in some sense historically unified, even if people don't conceptualize themselves this way. And even though, um, uh, like, say, you know, the category of homosexuality, does not in the 50 in the, the 15th century Florence was not yet available to describe or to understand what was actually happening, right? So there is this kind of like or heterosexuality, yes, precisely. Thank you, Hannah. Um, and then I really like that part of, of your remarks, it's very important. Um, so I think that that is important to remark that there is this kind of like objective development, but also it was not ever, and again, like this contingency thing, it was never guaranteed that this objective development would congeal into or solidify into sexuality as a form of identity that could be mobilized in certain ways and by certain people in certain classes. So the kind of the different forms, one of the things that he's tracing is like sexual hegemony, but, he, but the kind of, you know, the ruling, ruling classes of different centers of capital have been very flexible about how they've used sexual hegemony to their advantage. And sometimes they have not been able to be flexible enough, you know, like this is one of the, like, like to, they haven't been able to like, assert control. Um, shit's just like gotten out of hand on them. And, and, and that has produced other effects. Like that's, I think, a kind of interesting consequence. But, but I think what I was, maybe it's, this isn't different from what you were saying in some ways, or it doesn't, it does, it's, it, they can both coexist. But I, I think it's something about, rather than uh, sort of when does, um, I guess I thought that it, what this offer was, um, what I thought was some, a kind of somewhat or, or just another kind of interesting emphasis, which would be how do people become available as like the object, the object of or subject of policing? Kind of like how how do people? So which is the problem of the lumpen, right? Because in the in the exterior of the wage, people are doing all sorts of shit, and some of it's kind of fun, you know, like as uh like as even when that um even when the circumstances suck or whatever, like uh so that so often what the operation of the police is to do is that the police have a kind of anti pleasure anti public pleasure position like overall that's not specific to sodomy that they don't like. You know, if you want to like drink in the street with your friends and like maybe like have a fun argument and like yell a bit and then like lie down. I don't know if you're just like some houseless people who hang out in Manhattan or whatever. That's probably also not um, that also makes you a kind of uh, object of policing or whatever. So I, I guess I just thought of the the kind of problem as yeah, as well as the kind of political the construction of political movements around. Um, a different kind of sexual expression or whatever there's also the ways that they're sort of I mean obviously they both that they both completely coexist or whatever but there's a way that the state uses it as the way to kind of make someone available to be policed and that in that sense it has a kind of at least analogous not not only analogous function to race because there's several points in the book where you, you see the the race race and kind of the kind of problematization of like yeah racialization and the kind of lumpenization processes that I think Chris is describing in relation to sexuality happen kind of simultaneously and are kind of folded into each other or whatever so so they, I, I thought yeah that I guess but I I mean sorry maybe I'm repeating myself but I just I just thought that's a slightly different emphasis in some ways from from sort of social movements per se even though those are obviously also part of it because that's the because in some senses policing kind of those are co constitutive yeah. or whatever through policing can I can I share something um that is like yeah, uh, this this is this is a, a story about a lost chapter that I couldn't find. So you know, this may just be um, a useless uh, uh, titillation or not. But he, I remember, and I'm, I, 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 I don't know how far he got, but I remember he was talking about how he was going to do the, the the chapters were incomplete, right? Um, and so um, he did a lot more research for them than what ended up getting written. And one of the chapters I know he was going to write was a kind of longer examination of the, the French case, um, even though it doesn't quite fit with um, the Rigi uh, cycle. 
but he wanted to do this big sort of um, reading of um, the uh, this like Balzacian character um, in the French Revolution, who's like the first sort of police inspector of Paris. I think his name is Vautin, and he's like um, a, an ex. He's I mean he's he's like an ex-con who like sort of makes good and then becomes like a master of disguise. I mean, he writes all these novels. Um, and so, and, and his story is that, and this is kind of, I mean, this is a little bit present in, in, in the Arcades project, but his story is that one of the origins of modern sort of sexual forms or sexual identities or whatever is, um, is, is precisely this sort of like this, this, um, uh, this, you know, early modern like policing fantasy that you can like read criminality off of faces and the bourgeois sort of like um, love of like going into the crowd and seeing different types of people. And they would like publish these books with like different types of faces that represented the different types of people, which is exactly the sort of thing about like, how do you sort of like, how, 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 do, how does the undifferentiated crowd, which is actually a kind of historically um, new uh, feature of these sort of uh, uh, proletarianized cities, um, uh, how does that become um, differentiated and politically legible? And 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 it, and he he is saying, or he was trying to find a sort of um, substance to this idea that that comes directly from these sort of um, these like literary policing um, practices, where you could sort of read. I mean, obviously, it's like it's there in the sort of the, the Lombroso like criminology stuff. You could, um, yeah, it's 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 present in the kind of like colonial like you know, um, the ethnographies of, of different peoples that they encounter as they sort of, these same, these same sort of state forms discover the world, but, um, or discover themselves in the world or whatever. But um, um, yeah, I think, I, mean, I Hannah, I think, I think your point about sort of how, how, do, how do you, this individuating fa uh, like function of, of, of policing as a kind of like substance of, of politics from the sort of kind of individuating but also like both massifying and individuating you know kind of it massifies mm. because instead of just like here's a bunch of people who like look this way or like have oh you know whatever it kind of it kind of massifies it and it individuates when i say it, when i say it's like i think it's just more literal like it kind of police tend to disperse police the because obviously like the 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 capital you know the capitalist sphere the kind of co cohesion of, of the lumpen or whatever it has to be so one of the functions of yeah categorization or like or like um difference is to kind of like break up or to kind of or but even to like but not even as difference even to kind of create these categories that can then be police or whatever is one of the ways that it can the, the police can constitute themselves and also the, the people mm -hmm. who are um uh, victimized by the police kind of constitute themselves as like as, as a kind of entity or whatever i think as chris says pretty, pretty explicitly at some point uh, with reference to like archaic political theory or whatever and it also just to go back to go back to this idea of the lumpen in marx it's like the, I, the I, um in, in marx like the uh, there's a, yeah the heterogeneity or the kind of like manyness or the many the, diff, the, the 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 kind of decomposition almost the kind of um multitudinousness of like of the city it is the kind of part of the this part of what the lumpen is like lumpen people are a kind of mixed bag or whatever lumpenness is a kind of mixed bag and then and chris says something really interesting about normal he doesn't like the term normativity uh he prefers the idea of the status of the normal and i thought that was really helpful because in a way normativity does imply some myst mysterious kind of regulative function that is somehow producing uh, somehow is i don't know what it's doing it's maybe like bringing us into line in some way or, but i thought instead you could think yeah the idea that what what the state one of the things the state does it kind of assigns either the, the condition of normality or the condition of heterogeneity to people so you somehow even if you're just like you know like if, yeah if, you know like like in the in the walking while trans you know people referring to um a current now i don't remember the name of the the actual name of the bill but the like walking while trans bill where it's somehow just your presence as a trans person even if you're not heterogeneous in relation to your environment you might be the only trans person in the street or whatever somehow already kind of renders you as a like ob as a kind of object of suspicion or ever so people kind of carry the essence of a kind of heterogeneity like within them i thought i mean maybe it's not then i was like oh no i'm just reinventing queer theory from, for no reason or whatever, but I thought at least it's more Marxist this time. <laughs> <laughs> Can I leap in here with a couple of thoughts? Um, so one is that I I hear you, Hannah, on lumpenization, but I think it's important not to press on that too hard because like who, you know, like, uh, I think that like the category of employment 
it, and which, and, and sort of like, you know, unemployment, if you're unemployment, if you're chaotically poor, that's usually the thing that kind of like consigns you to this like category of like lumping or whatever, but the category of employment is an empirical category, right? And it's not, and, and so, you know, like people can wear what Rosemary Hennessy calls, and I think this is one of the things you're referring to, the second skin of, you know, like the thing that makes you a target of abjection. Um, and she document, like Hennessy documents this like really rigorously in the Maculadoras on the US-Mexico border among people who are employed in factories, among like gay men and trans women and, 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 and cis women who are employed in factories and who are variously marked out for certain kinds of police violence. Um, so I, I think it's just important, like while I'm hearing you, I think I, it's, you know, I think it's more helpful all, almost to talk about like, just to, to think also about like, just like, you know, pro, like, the proletariat, like as a as a, like as a class, like it, to a certain extent, this uh, and and that's like segmented in various ways. But that that th this does have to do with like policing, not just a portion of that class, but like the class overall, in order to marshal, in order to marshal surplus labor into, uh, in order to discipline surplus labor in certain ways, in order to pull people back into employment and push them out of employment. So, I mean, I just think that this is like a little bit broader. And the other thing is, I, I wonder if we can maybe take questions because people have lots <laughs> of things, lots of yes. things to say in the chat. Um, so we are running late, but we can go over a little. Uh, nothing's gonna happen to us. Um, so yes, we do have a question. Um, I have a question that's maybe annoyingly niche, and if so, please ignore. Uh, alongside sexual hegemony, I've recently been reading a bunch of position papers from the Toronto Marxist Institute's gay courses in the 70s, and a lot of them are trying to build up an approach to thinking through the histories of sexuality and of capital through the lens of Engels in Origin of the Family. So like heterosexuality plays an ideological function in naturalizing a gendered division of reproductive labor, the state's repression of homosexuality would be stronger at times when this gender division was more important for the contemporary strategies of capital accumulation, which is different from Chitty's engagement with Origi. How would you say Chitty's approach differs from what seemed like a promising angle for earlier generations of gay Marxists? Who wants to tackle that? Graham, do you want to just like unmute yourself and talk about this a little bit? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it just, uh, it, 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 it feels like, so I, yeah, I've been reading all these old position papers from the seventies, uh, from somebody's basement. And uh, <laughs> like, it, it's really interesting because like, I, I, I've been thinking about them a lot while reading the book and I thought about them again um, when, when Kay was talking about how you know, one of the things that's sort of like really exciting with this book is, you know, relating the history of sexuality to the history of, of, of property and of class struggle, right? And like, it's been really interesting to see these sort of traces of early generations of, of gay Marxists, all of whom were involved in various like Trotskyist, Maoist, anti-revisionist, like orthodox, like whatever communist parties, but coming together to talk about being gay. Um, and like, What's cool, well, one of the things that's cool in reading this stuff is that, you know, th there was a sense that, you know, Marxism has not theorized sexuality very well or how it relates to, um, to gender, right? Marxism has not done that very well. And so maybe something that we can bring to the table as gay Marxist militants is trying to, to figure out ways of, of, of bridging these, right? And maybe contributing to the development of that theory. And then that didn't really happen, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, I mean, there are people who picked it up since, like, like John DeBilio, who you mentioned, um, but you know, it, it, it's certainly been pretty marginal to the, the overall uh, like academic literature on this stuff. Um, but so it, it, it was really interesting that, you know, it seems like they're sort of trying to hone in on a similar problem to some of what Chitty is trying to hone in on. But going at it from very different perspectives, right? I mean, one of them probably is that I imagine Foucault hadn't been translated yet, or, you know, these weren't all academics, so maybe they, they, they just weren't reading what was available. Um, but it, it is really interesting that, you know, one, one of the things that they talk about a lot is, well, relating it to gender, right? Relating the issues of, of gay liberation to 
the issues of women's liberation um, and trying to sort of draw from those like theoretical sources, uh, which really were, you know, tracing back to like Engels's take on the origin of the family, uh, understanding that heterosexuality is sort of constructed as a way of naturalizing a particular gender division of, of productive versus reproductive labor uh, that is important in different ways and to varying extents at different historical junctures, right? Um, and so I, I've been sort of surprised, uh, not, not, not in a bad way, not disappointed, but you know, surprised uh, reading sexual hegemony and seeing that this doesn't really come up. It's, it's alluded to in a few places, but it's not really dug into uh, with any depth. And so I, I'm, why? <laughs> sorry, I, I, this is a very oh, it, long, sprawling no, question that can go in a lot of directions. So I'm sorry, I'll shut up. No, you're fine. I mean, so one, it's wonderful to see you and I, I hope you've been keeping safe and well and I, I, I miss you intensely. Um, and I miss home. Uh, as this question is putting me in mind of, um, uh, Canadian communists are some of my favorites. Um, and um, I think that there is an overlap between this view that Chitty is trying out um, and arguing for and an approach that emphasizes the role of the family in various forms of social reproduction. And what would that be? Well, if to the extent that proletarianization means things like the generalization or the, the, a, a certain kind of socialization of social reproduction, mm, I don't wanna say that, a scaling up of social reproduction, right? If you push people into cities, you have to, um, uh, uh, take care of hygiene and access to water and food and rest and things like this on a much greater scale in a much more concentrated way than for, um, I was actually gonna guess that it was Tim McCaskill. It's so funny. Um, I, I, it, much more concentrated way than if you were doing that to a bunch of people who are distributed much more sparsely on rural estates, right? Um, and so what does that mean? That also means that like the rule of the family is simultaneously weakened, uh, which also allows for, you know, um, for instance, not just, but it allows for men to do other things with their time, right? And this seems important. Um, for something like a development of sexual, Simil similarly, you know, to the extent at, at other points when the family has re regained its force as like a form of social reproduction, I think you could probably relate that. And Max, you look like you maybe have something to say about this. Um, but you can maybe relate that to um, uh, uh, certain intensifications of, um, let's say sexual hegemony, but I don't, I don't think it's like necessarily a linear relationship, but I think these, these things are in somehow in dialogue. It often he mentions, Chris mentioned several times like the seclusion of women as a kind of almost like one of the like preconditions of a situation where you get this politicization of um, sex between men. Um, and um, I, I don't remember the exact part now, but it comes up, that phrase particularly comes up several times. I know he's been in dialogue with like Maya Gonzalez and like end notes people and it did and it did make me think a lot of like the logic of gender and or, or I felt that would be consonant with a lot of the ways he's trying to argue things so and and uh the argument that end notes make in that is to do with um how the wage is instituted as a kind of predominant even even in an imaginary sense as well as in a literal sense of accumulation like as a as a kind of predominant social form so how part of how the wage is instituted is you have to produce this concept of a private sphere so you leave you know, the difference between the wage and like more open forms of domination such as like direct slavery is that you kind of leave uh, your place of work and you go home and you uh, reproduce yourself at home and then you turn up again next day. So there's this whole thing that happens kind of between when work ends and when it begins again. Next day, it's like the private sphere and there's obviously like, this, so that's why there's so much attention to this kind of like Buddhist moment and the various ways it kind of instituted the family as the kind of externality, as a kind of externality of the wage. So that, that becomes gendered. So in, in um, 
uh, Maya Gonzalez's account, it's like an indirectly market mediated sphere. It's not a sphere that has nothing to do with the market, but the ways it's mediated by the market are indirect and are more through direct relations of domination rather than exploitation or whatever. And I think it does seem, yeah, I don't know what you think, Max, but I feel like it's, it's pretty convergent with that in the sense that the, the kind of originary scene is always the exclusion of women from the, the first thing that happens is you exclude women from the from public space and then you and then you immediately get so I think that's um uh, Chris Nealon ended the the talk at the book launch with this idea about that the book kind of posits a kind of sexuality of circumstance um which I found appealing as a chaos bisexual but um but I guess that is sort of part of what you know so there's as well there's the whole spectrum of possible sexual attitudes and it includes people who we'd recognize as gay and people we'd recognize as straight and so on but it was I think there's also the idea that like uh, because of the changes in the changes in the constitution of public and private make change make changes in people's sexual behavior and 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 so on as well but maybe that doesn't obviously fully address it. yeah i don't i don't know if i'm gonna answer your question directly but yeah i think i mean i think that it, like i was saying in the very beginning i was like i've 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 kind of i've come to a new understanding of it that's maybe kind of like what i wanted actually to have been um doing but i think that like there's a, there's another line that I, that that, that um, reading is is hinged on, which is that basically like um, uh, what would constitute the queer as a kind of historical as its its historical existence is the way that it antagonized the family basically. So he doesn't write he's not writing a story of the family, but that's basically the sort of condition of intelligibility for these sort of archives, these objects that he's working with. Um, and the other thing is that. Um, yeah, the kind of like like Kay was saying, and and this is this is there in in, in the angles, um, in the origin, or less in the origin of the family, and more in the sort of condition of the working class. But it's like the proletarians are don't have family life, right? They're kind of they're living in in sexual anarchy in ways that sort of terrify the bourgeoisie. Um, and there's these you know those chapters on the on on, on the the working day maybe in, in capital where they have like the sort of the reformers who take the safaris or whatever and they're like oh my gosh they're living like children and parents are sleeping in the same bed and all all sorts of mysterious sexual encounters are taking place to, and that's obviously also or not obviously that's the sort of that's the that's the anxiety that um motivates malthusianism also right like you want to have these work houses that are sex segregated because otherwise all these proletarians are going to start breeding but then you have to make sure they're not having sex with each other anyway and so that invents or that sort of generates the, the homosexual um worry um but sort of more i mean um I, I mean, it, he, yeah, so he is, so he is kind of working with that. But the other thing is that he's not, he never, I don't think he ever quite lands on a way of, he's, he's not making like a functionalist argument necessarily in the way that you would maybe need to say like for capital accumulation to thrive or whatever, uh, we need, um, gendered social reproduction or whatever and therefore we have heterosexuality to 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 and to assure that um and that may just be because he's looking at moments of um breakdown in sort of cycles of accumulation and if he had been looking at the sort of the what does Ariki call it the um the wonderful moments um uh rather than the signs of autumn or the financialization um then he would have a different story and maybe have a different sort of theory of, of, of what these things the, are the role of the family in different historical moments changes so there's moments when the family form is actually encouraging uh guys to have sex with each other and then there's moments where this i, I think it, it seems to really shift around like what and mm -hmm. i mean and i guess it kind of maybe solidified and obviously as we come closer to the present day account of the family comes closer to maybe one of the ways we would think about it. I think he does end up with the point that you made, um, Graham, about um, I think the idea that a kind of uh, a kind of decreasing like public private distinction with kind of more informal or like uh, uh, precarious or like uh, chaotic <laughs> uh, forms of labor that itself somehow means that yeah is, is what's kind of deteriorate and, and then Chris Nealon also says this in the um, uh, in the introduction or whatever that that's going to like basically he, I think his prediction is that will completely decompose the ca the very category of like gay or whatever and actually it's funny because Chris Nealon in the introduction is like it's going to decompose the category of gay and lesbian which is weird because I don't think Chris T is in any he explicitly like via Adrian Rich says he's not talking about lesbians at all because once women have been kind of the point is like women are secluded into this like public uh, this private sphere so kind of um 
whatever they do is whatever. And I actually, I was curious about that because he, um, and I was thinking, because I've just been reading this book on the history of the factory and there's this part about the Lowell Mill girls or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I can't remember what it was, it Massachusetts or something. And yeah. they, and I was like, I was like, was there no lesbian scandals or whatever? And I couldn't find any, I mean, I was just Googling. So maybe there is stuff, but I was like, no one's like, oh my God, they're fisting in the boarding houses or whatever. That's not, <laughs> so I think it's sort of pretty convincingly that somehow the structure of like lesbophobia or whatever is just quite different because it is, it has been included into, into a private sphere that's kind of anarchic or whatever, or at least Aristotle, he goes back to Aristotle making this argument that like the problem with women is almost because they're confined into this like inner sphere where they're not subject to civic law. They're kind of just doing whatever, you know, like women are doing crazy shit, which I was like, oh, that is a really amazing like historical genesis for the zany interiority of, 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 of uh, you know, the femme or whatever. But like, um, I don't know if he's necessarily trying to do that, but you do get these little glimmers of, um, of moments where he's kind of like, has to, he kind of has to start theorizing what's going on with women as well, because I think he can't really think gay guys without women in a way because it's about misogyny to some degree or whatever um or, or or at least that's one way of reading the ways that um that you know the kind of like get, getting fucked kind of yeah. takes on a really different like valence for example or whatever you can i think it, it seems helpful to read that somewhat through uh misogyny or whatever cool. although i guess it has a, yeah it, i mean again that that shifts at different moments it seems like but yeah the family seems to operate as to have different functions at different moments or whatever according to what the kind of vagaries of accumulation are doing we are at 8.45, <laughs> so we're a little over. So I do want to bring this to a close before we uh, just disintegrate slowly. Um, but thank you all so much. Thank you, Kay. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Max. This has been a really interesting night and discussion, and I would love it to be a course, uh, honestly. We used to host, uh, and I hope we will host in the future, those Brooklyn Institute for Social Research oh, yeah. courses, which have been so great. I really enjoy them. I get to attend them myself. Um, and this sounds like a great one. So Ooh, think I on that. <laughs> I love that. It makes me wish that they had hired me in the fall. <laughs> <laughs> Did you propose some courses? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're what, they're dumbass loss. <laughs> exactly. Well, Kay, maybe you should talk to the bureau directly about hosting. <laughs> I was gonna say, why don't you start your own? Wait, can I can I respond really quickly to these two of questions? Because I think yeah, yeah. because Hannah's last point really led into the first one about. So yeah, I mean, just really briefly, um, he does talk about how the one of one of the sort of conditioning um, factors in in the sort of emergence of the modern form of the homosexual is the kind of like reemergence of bourgeois women into the public space of the city. Um, and that they kind of like, and this is like one of his less, um, uh, I love it kind of arguments, but he's like, they, they kind of like extended the, the, the domestic norms into the, into the sort of urban space or whatever, and that kind of generated. And so in particular, there was this war over pissing in the street. And so they, the women were like scandalized by the sight of all this um, urine. And so they uh, installed um, what he calls, um, urinals he calls um, temples of urethral eroticism and to kind of like concentrate um, this sort of previously dispersed um, like male free not quite sexuality but sort of like scandalous um, conduct and then obviously that becomes like sites for cruising and so there's this funny dialectic where like the the the, the homosexual is the product of like a sort of a, a feminization of a sort of bourgeois um uh, interior space extended into the city. Um, and then to Dominic's question, I don't have a good answer because what's fascinating about this book is he doesn't talk about desire, like mm -hmm. at all. It's basically, it's like, I, like sort of like the, cir the circumstance thing is like as, as, um, as extensive as he, as he goes. It's just like people want to have sex with each other when they're around or they're like, you know, they are not around each other. And so they're like weird to each other, but like he does, it's so not about like how that, how that happens in the in, in, in that register. It's it's really funny. So sorry. <laughs> not at all. Thank you. <laughs> so again, uh, I do want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, thank you to everyone who donated and to folks who bought the book. Um, you can still do that. Hopefully tonight inspired you to read the book. And I also want to get reading notes from all three of you about book recommendations, because you're smart and you're interesting. And these are great discussions to have. And often ones that are not 
had in queer spaces, unfortunately. Um, class gets very short shrift, uh, especially in this country. So thank you so much. Um, and I think that's it. I'm gonna post this, the recording of this event uh, on our YouTube channel and you can check it out there or share it with others who wanted to see it. So thank you everybody. Thank Have a lovely you. night. Thank, thank you, Max. Thank, thank you, much. Hannah. Thank you, Kay. Good night. Good night, everybody. See you soon.